What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at it again with another video. So, we're going to check out. Damn it, I don't know what we're going to check out. I didn't have the screen pulled up, y'all. <laughs> 10 terrible views that ending with Craig Bass. I, I, bro, I forgot what, what we was checking out. Um, <clears throat> Here's the thing. Sometimes the feuds of a particular, uh, you know, particular two uh, wrestlers or whatnot could be, um, I guess you could say, not that good. But then when it gets to the pay-per-view event, it's like a five-star classic, and you're trying to figure out how did that happen? This feud has been kind of boring, kind of mid, but the match was great. And that sometimes happens in, in WWE. The feud itself is no one really cares about, but when the match gets there, everyone's raving about it. So it's a weird, it's a weird thing that can happen, especially in WWE. So we're gonna check this out. Appreciate all love and support. Let's get right into this thing. Old saying in life, not the hooks, I have a child. There's another old saying in life, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. The way you end up is secondary to the scenic route you take, and you know that because ultimately, the final destination is death. Cheerful business. In wrestling, it's wow. the other way around. The match is almost always more important than the story that gets us there. After all, what's more heartbreaking than an amazing feud full of twists and turns that ends with an awful match? Makes yeah. you think, what's the point of any of this? Or to put it more simply, Randy Orton. However, sometimes it's yeah. the other way around. Sometimes the feud is like wading through sweaty molasses, only for the blow-off match to be surprisingly incredible. It's kind of magical when that happens, when against <laughs> all odds, a match rules, making it all worth it after all. I'm Adam Hailing from Parts of Unknown, and here are 10 terrible feuds that ended with great matches. While you're here, like and subscribe to Parts of Unknown, or we'll have a terrible feud with you that will end in a great murder. Number 10, oh, Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar, SummerSlam 2019. What a weird 2019 Seth Rollins had. He won the Royal Rumble, <laughs> won world championships at both WrestleMania and SummerSlam, and somehow uh -huh. ended the year about as popular as a skunk in a lift. Probably had something to do with A, this bastard match bastard, yeah. and B, him tweeting about how rich he was constantly. Doesn't change the fact that he's gonna yeah. be remembered as one. Yeah, it's one of those type of things where it's like, Rollins, he, at that time, he was, he wasn't taking the criticism very well. Granted, wrestling fans can be some of the worst fans out there. But he wasn't taking it in stride. In fact, he was kind of coming off as a prick online, so it didn't really help. On the best of all time, <laughs> due in no small part to bangers like the main event of SummerSlam 2019. The feud going into that main event was assholes. Brock winning money in the bank despite yeah. not being in the match, Which dancing around with the briefcase like your dad trying to teach you about the perils of gangs, cashing in, then murdering Seth every single week, just making him look like an, an absolute twat every Monday night. However, when the end result is a proper David versus Goliath masterpiece and a main event that's actually match of the night, we accept uh -huh. that sometimes there's a method to the Brock Lesnar booking madness. Number yeah. nine, Sheamus versus Big Show, Hell in a Cell 2012. You know how everyone hated Roman Reigns because they tried to make him into the new John Cena, aka an inhumanly chipper stand-up comedian who shrugged off villains by winking at the crowd and saying to his opponent, yeah, I lost, but look at your weird penis. Well, WWE <laughs> also did that with Sheamus in 2012 and it worked just as well being in endless feuds with the likes of alberto del rio and even worse big show never ever <clears throat> taking them seriously winking saying fella and it was absolutely maddening until hell in a cell 2012 and big show made him pay for it with his ginger soul for the most part the match is actually not that great the worst elements of big show's slow pacing and sheamus's bland baby face in peril shtick but somehow the match keeps going and unlike every other time that big show has been the easily conquerable unconquerable big boss this time he remembered he was a giant and refused to die resulting in a final stretch of a match that is genuinely wonderful mm -hmm. and unexpected from both men who are so easily made bland by wwe's template storytelling number mm -hmm. eight shinsuke nakamura versus aj styles money in the bank 2018 after backlash 2018 when their no disqualification match ended with synchronized dick kicks and yeah. double ten count, <laughs> there's no way that shinsuke nakamura versus aj styles will be remembered as anything other than a failure of a feud. Add yeah. to that cocktail with a cap or cock, their WrestleMania match being watched by the sleepiest fans in all the land, them having another- Yeah, that WrestleMania was just too long. It, it That match should have been much better. And, and it wasn't even like, it was awful. It was just, it, they, the crowd just didn't have no more energy, bro. It, 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 that was unfortunate for them. The match in Saudi Arabia that ended in a double <coughs> count out. You are completely justified in forgetting the fact that Money in the Bank 2018, their last man standing match, ruled. Did it rule to the point where it justified WWE booking five matches in two months between the two men? 
No, nothing no. can justify that. And thank you, WWE, for not doing that anymore since Dinosaur Dick had his claws prized off the book. But it's a really good <laughs> match that deserves to be revisited. It even pays off the endless nut shots in a satisfying enough way. At least we got this one, I suppose. At least we got this. <laughs> Number seven, Death Triangle versus House of Black, Double or Nothing 2022. Bloody hell, this feud went on a bit. All in all, the House of Black began feuding with Death Triangle around about February, and the feud didn't pay off until May. That's some WWE levels of stretching things yeah. out. It all seemed super aimless as well. House of Black would show up, attack someone, rinse, repeat. And they were doing that with multiple different teams, not just Death Triangle. They bothered Fuego Del Sol a bunch, hounded the Varsity Blondes and Julia Hart a bunch, beat Death Triangle with Eric Redbeard at Revolution. It just went on and on. Both teams just attacking each other with no real storyline progression beyond that. Didn't help that Ray Phoenix was out with a broken arm and they wanted to Jeez. wait till he was back to do the match properly, but credit where it's due, at Double or Nothing 2022, they did the match properly. It ruled. They even tied everything up with Julia Hart turning heel and doing black gobs in Pat's mm -hmm. face. To be fair, he's from Newcastle. It's one of the more sanitary ways he's ended a night. A little piece of Trios brilliance that was almost worth the wait. He said Number almost. Six, Bray Wyatt versus John Cena, WrestleMania 36. The worst thing that ever happened to Bray Wyatt was meeting John Cena, with yeah. a psycho clown that laughs last, laughs longest. Wyatt and Cena have actually had two feuds that ended with baller matches. Their first uh -huh. in 2014 saw the invincible Wyatt family be made to look like reet knobs for weeks on end, losing at Mania, only winning at Extreme Rules with the help. Him losing at Mania is still uh, another bad, bad decision. Uh, imagine if he would have beat John Cena. At WrestleMania, I believe that was, I think that was WrestleMania 30. I want to say that was WrestleMania 30. Imagine if he would have beat John Cena. Could have did wonders for his career at that time, for sure. Helps of Creeps Jr. And then ending with a last man standing match, which was very good indeed, mm -hmm. but also ended with Bray being literally buried under a pile <laughs> of equipment. Fast forward six years to WrestleMania 36, and the wretched 2014 feud ends up being the entire basis for a Fiend Cena feud. Though you mm -hmm. can't even really call it a feud. Cena just swings by to dunk on Wyatt like an uncle on Christmas Day, popping in to remind everyone that you pissed yourself 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. It all looked horrible. It was like it was going to happen again until the Firefly Funhouse match happened. Which was and then very it was the best cinematic wrestling that it's that, ever been. No matter how many ultraviolet good. discos Bray wrestles in nowadays, they can't take that away from him. Number five, the Young Bucks versus FTR Full Gear 2020. AEW really surprised everyone when they fucked this one up, didn't they? This was back in the day, less than one year on from the first Dynamite, and the company was still riding high from neatly plotted feuds like Cody versus MJF, Moxley versus Omega, the elite slow implosion. So when FTR arrived in AEW, the best tag team in NXT history seemed on a natural collision course with the best tag team in AEW history, the Young Bucks. Yeah. As a dream match had been stoked by fan speculation online pettiness for eons, surely this thing writes itself. <laughs> Whoa, no, it did. No, it didn't, though, with AEW going a really confusing route with it. Both teams being friends, then Bucks were sort of heels, and then FTR were sort of heels. They didn't really acknowledge their history all that much, and then Young Buck said if they lost, he'd never challenge for the belts again. Only a year after Cody run that exact same stiff against Chris Jericho, it was a hot, unfocused mess. But then the match was one of the best matches of the year, so I don't know. It's, it's wrestling sometimes. <laughs> Number four, Sasha Banks versus Bianca Belair, WrestleMania 37. This feud fucking sucked. Can they coexist has turned into uh, a long running in joke for wrestling fans because it seemed to be the only way. That's all. That's always a thing. Can they coexist? Uh, the Will they be able to work together even though they're going to be opponents in a couple of weeks? You know, we've seen that story so many times in wrestling. <laughs> WWE knew how to book feuds between two baby faces. At the 2021 Royal Rumble, Bianca lasted from number three to win the thing looking like an unspeakable badass in the process. The boss, Sasha Banks, was SmackDown champion at the height of her charismatic superstar powers. Now, I may be only a simple country hyper chicken, but if I was in charge of booking a showdown between two of the hottest prospects on SmackDown, I might not book them to lose back-to-back -back tag matches on pay-per-view against Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler, featuring heavy prominence from Reginald, the Cirque du Soleil scrappy do of the women's f***ing tag division. <laughs> I just might not do that. Despite both women coming off their feud looking incompetent, even creative couldn't dim their shine, having no, one of the best and most emotionally out. satisfying world title <clears throat> matches in recent WrestleMania They history, showed out. Honestly, sometimes wrestling's easy.
Just just let them fight. Stop <laughs> overcomplicating things. And speaking of, number three, The Rock versus Steve Austin, WrestleMania X7. Potentially the best world title match in WrestleMania history. Uh -huh. and potentially the best WrestleMania in WrestleMania uh -huh. history. So much so that everyone well, forgets how much it. needless Deborah was in the feud leading up to X7. Because again, WWE panics when it has to book face versus face and tries to stump up artificial drama. Uh -huh. As if Rock versus Austin, the two biggest baby faces of the decade, would ever need need that because he's a little and here's the thing i get it you know they traditionally want to do heel versus face but once again they didn't have to it sells itself you don't have to have a heel in when it when we're talking about these two guys stone cold and the rock it works regardless they don't there doesn't have to be a heel and face dynamic people are going to cheer for whoever they want to cheer for and people love them both so it's one of those things, no one really had to go heel here. No one really had to. It's just, I want to be the best. I need to win a championship. I need to retain a championship. It's all about the championship. That's it. Nothing else. It's nothing personal. Just business. I, that's just my personal opinion, my personal take on it. Trickster, Vince made Deborah, Steve Austin's <clears throat> wife, who incidentally is as accomplished at wrestling promos as a tablespoon of cold piss, he made her the manager to The Rock. Almost immediately, the feud turned from a clash of gods into a soap opera squabble. I mean, who doesn't like seeing Steve Austin bickering? That's why we fell in love with him in the first place. The whole angle fell flat and was promptly ditched a few days before Mania. Bam, she's not a factor. And thankfully, no over-the-top soap opera silliness ever again graces Steve Austin Rock feud. That's some patented Adam Blompier restaurant quality sarcasm. Number two, <laughs> Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar, WrestleMania 31. Mm -hmm. To be honest, it wasn't just a main event between definitely about to leave the company Brock Lesnar and the least popular dog since Cujo Roman Reigns. Most <laughs> matches at WrestleMania 31 were built f***ing terribly. The IC ladder match was built around the wrestlers tiptoeing around like cartoon characters stealing the belt. Triple H versus Sting was built around magical teleporting Heath Slaters. And Bray Wyatt versus Undertaker was built around a combustible rocking chair it was a rough time to be a fan reigns won the royal rumble that everyone wanted daniel bryan to win yep. he's gonna fight lesnar at the wrestlemania where brock's contract was set to expire the wrong guy in a match that he couldn't lose yeah fucking dreadful paul Heyman did his best to inject life into the feud but no one was having it it was an absolutely dire situation for all involved crescendoing with a laughably bad angle on the go home raw lesnar and reigns snatching the title off each <laughs> i remember that bro they're just holding the title. It's mine. No, it's mine. Look. Oh, God. That was just. I, I just. But the match was fucking fantastic. Match was great each other like children squabbling over who gets the last pack of quavers in the shop it almost makes you laugh the one saving grace of both competitors they're able to smack each other around like nobody's business and the last shot of the feud before the match starts contains no violence a week later at wrestlemania one small announcement about lesnar's contract being extended later suddenly the match is dynamite because of course uh -huh. it is it's intense it's bloody there's no pissing around they hit each other really hard it's really great yeah. with a really weird and interesting crowd dynamic dynamic before WWE pulls one of the greatest switcheroos yep. they ever pulled. Bastards. Bastards, why'd you keep our hope alive? And number one, WCW <laughs> versus WWE Survivor Series 2001. The Invasion Storyline. Yeah. In 2001, the newly bought WCW home to wrestling legends like Sting, Ric Flair, Goldberg, the NWO, invaded the turf of their longtime rivals WWF, and precisely none of those <laughs> legends showed up. The of star course. power in WCW's invading army was so weak that the chief antagonist of the alliance ended up being Kurt Angle, a man who'd never wrestled a day for World Championship Wrestling, Shane McMahon, and Steve Austin. The guy yeah. was famously fired from WCW and became the biggest star in the industry in the WWF. Yeah. Makes total sense. Despite the months-long feud being a garbled mess of swerves, title changes, and compromises, even the storyline's fiercest critics have to admit that winner-take-all match at Survivor mm -hmm. Series was un- Real. That huge was, stakes, huge stars. That, that, bro, that shit was so fun. That winner takes all. Oh, that shit was so fun. I love that match. Eight out of the ten wrestlers were WWE guys. Shush, though. Hot crowd, wonderfully catty performances from Hayden yeah. and JR on commentary. It's absolutely yeah. not the ending <laughs> to the. That shit was great. <laughs> Nick and JR. That's it. You're out of a job. You're out of a job. <laughs> <clears throat> 
<clears throat> that shit was great. JR was trolling the hell out of Paul Heyman. That's it. You're out of a job. The interpromotional war fans had spent years dreaming of, but as an isolated wrestling match, it is sheer lightning and an unfortunate reminder that no matter how bad wrestling gets, you can never stop watching or you might miss something like this. Yeah, yeah, stop it. <laughs> Why can't I quit you? And that's our list. What's been your favorite great match from a terrible feud? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like and share this. <laughs> nah, that's, that's facts. That's how it usually happens. The feud can be just awful to the point where you don't care. And then all of a sudden, the match is actually quite entertaining and very good. So comment down below. Let me know what's a feud that you just thought was just boring. But when the match actually came across, you actually enjoyed it. And you were wondering, where did this come from? So, I appreciate all love and support. Roll to 150K. I'm still your undisputed YouTube wrestling champ and your Interclutch World Heavyweight Champion. Appreciate y'all kicking with me. See y'all next one. Peace.